Hi, good evening. My name is Mindy Hankin, and I am the CEO of the Mandel JCC. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our beautiful JCC this evening for tonight's program. The JCC is very proud to partner with all the agencies that are listed on your program for tonight's event. I want to just take this moment and wish everyone a Shana Tova, a Happy New Year. It's my hope that in this new year you will continue to come to uh, Jewish programs and all the Jewish agencies in our community to support our agencies, to become a member of the JCC and involved in all of our agencies and synagogues throughout the, com throughout the community. Um, we're going to get started with tonight's program. Enjoy. If you haven't been to the JCC before, please take a moment after tonight's event and take a tour of the center. Any of the JCC staff would be happy to give you a tour. Thank you. Have a good time. Thank you again, Mindy. My name is Brooke Weiner. On behalf of Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County, I want to welcome you to this program that comes at a pivotal time for the Jewish people. Anti-Semitism and hostility against Israel is unfortunately a daily reality and has been a rampant issue for centuries. In today's world, we do not always expect it. However, during and following the recent military conflict with Israel and Hamas, anti-Semitism was evident everywhere. This summer, we witnessed an explosion of anti-Semitic violence in Europe, Latin America, and elsewhere. A recent published survey of anti-Semitism attitudes in 100 countries found that 24% of Western Europe citizens harbor anti-Semitic attitudes. In Eastern Europe, it's even worse. All in all, one quarter of the world's population holds some kind of anti-Jewish prejudice. We will hear more on this tonight from a representative from the Anti-Defamation League, which published this heartbreaking report. There are far too many episodes of anti-Semitism we've seen recently across the world. There are far too many, I'm sorry, I recently Two Israeli tourists were killed as an unknown assailant opened fire at the Jewish Museum in Brussels. During an anti-Israel demonstration in Paris, two synagogues in Paris were attacked. Congregants were trapped inside while attackers ruthless, ruthlessly fought to get in. In Venezuela, the government attempted, is that better? Sorry. <laughs> In Venezuela, the government had attempted to force Jews to condemn Israel. Meanwhile, Israel continues to be the target of boycotts of, in the academia and academic associations. The boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, also known as BDS, discriminates against Israeli institutions, professors, and students for no other reason than their nationality and the distorted perception of the policies of their government. Academics are destroying the principles that guide through academia, through the promotion of distortion and hiding behind the veil of free speech. It's time to stand up to rising anti-Semitism by raising some serious questions this evening. How do we need to evaluate the anti-Semitism of today? Is today's anti-Semitism a fad, a phenomenon, or simply a sad truth? Is one-sided criticism of Israel another manifestation of anti-Semitism? What is the U.S. government doing about this rising problem? More important, what do we do about it? I want to thank the Jewish community. 
Relations Council of the Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County for making this evening possible. This program is also made possible in part by the One World Project of the Leonard and Sophie Davis Fund for Tolerance Program in the Greater Palm Beach Jewish Community. The One World Project supports programs addressing ideas and activities relating to tolerance, diversity, social justice, and multiculturalism. These ideas will be explored through a variety of methodologies and with different age groups throughout the Palm Beach service area. This multi-year initiative is designed to be collaborative and further the idea of a compassionate and caring Palm Beach County. I also, I also want, want to thank David, David and Lisa Lexi, there's a Lisa, um, for sponsoring this program. program. Likewise, Likewise, I want, want to express, express my gratitude to all the Federation departments and partners that participated in this and future programs. Jewish Professionals Network, Cole Lisha, Next Gen, the Mantle Jewish Community Center, and the Anti-Defamation League. I want to recognize the presence of many of his team colleagues. David Phillips, President and CEO, Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County. Representative Patrick Murphy of Florida's 18th Congressional District. Philippe Latrilliar, Council General of France in Miami. Jurgen Borsch, Council General of Germany, Germany Miami. Now, now it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator of tonight's event. Dr. Stephen Sussman is an associate professor of public administration at our university, where he teaches in the master and bachelor of public administration programs. He earned his PhD in political science from Georgia State University. Dr. Sussman has lectured extensively in the U.S. and in Israel. Dr. Sussman is a member of several boards of directors in our community and is also a past vice president of the Palm Beach Synagogue. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Sussman. Well, thank you, Brooke, for the kind introduction. I don't think this is going to fit on here. Uh, as you heard, my name is Stephen Sussman, and I will be the moderator for this evening's forum. Before I introduce the speakers, I want to remind everyone of tonight's guidelines. Each speaker will speak for approximately 15 minutes. Later, we will have a question and answer period. Along with your program, you have, you have all been given a card on which to write your questions. When requested, pass the card to the volunteers who will pick them up and bring them to me. I will do my best to ask as many questions as possible. Now, this evening's speakers. Hava Holzauer is the Anti-Defamation League's Regional Director for the State of Florida. Deeply committed to fighting anti-Semitism and protecting the rights of all Americans, Ms. Holzauer oversees ADL's work in Florida, including monitoring domestic extremist activity, providing anti-bullying and cyber-bullying education, training law enforcement on domestic extremism and hate crimes, preserving civil liberties and religious freedom, advocating for Israel, safeguarding Jewish institutions and conducting Holocaust education workshops. Ms. Holzauer is an experienced civil and criminal litigator. She served with the Palm Beach County State Attorney's Office where she handled hate crime cases. Ms. Holzauer's place of work, the ADL, Florida Regional Office in Boca Raton, serves the entire state. 
and fights anti-Semitism and all forms of discrimination through information, education, legislation, and advocacy. Dr. Charles Small is the director of the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism and Policy. He is also the correct distinguished scholar at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Dr. Small earned his Bachelor of Arts in Political Science at McGill University in Montreal, a Master's of Science in Urban Development, Planning, and Economics at University College in London, and a Doctor of Philosophy from Oxford University. Dr. Small has performed research in Montreal, London, and in many cities across Israel. Dr. Small was the founding director of the Yale Initiative for the Interdisciplinary Study of Anti-Semitism, the first interdisciplinary research center on anti-Semitism at a North American university. At Yale, he taught in the political science department in the program on ethics, politics, and economics, and ran a post-doctorate and graduate studies fellowship program dedicated to anti-Semitism research. He has lectured internationally and worked as a consultant and policy advisor in North America, Europe, Southern Africa, and the Middle East. Dr. Small specializes in social and cultural theory, globalization, national identity, socio-cultural policy, and racism. In 2013, Ira Foreman was sworn in as special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. Inspired by his parents' values, Mr. Foreman has dedicated 30 years of experience to Jewish communal work and public service. Mr. Foreman received his BA from Harvard University, where he graduated magna cum laude in government. He received his MBA from Stanford University's Graduate School of Business. More recently, Mr. Foreman served as the Jewish Outreach Director for the Obama for America campaign. He served for nearly 15 years as the Executive Director of the National Jewish Democratic Council and spent four years with the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, APAC, where he worked as political director and legislative liaison. He has also served on the boards of a number of Jewish nonprofits. In the Clinton administration, Mr. Foreman was the director of congressional relations for the Office of Personnel Management. Earlier in his career, he worked as professional staff of the Public Works and Transportation Committee of the U.S. House of Representatives. Throughout his career, he has spoken and written extensively on Jewish history and public policy. Mr. Foreman co-edited and wrote for the reference book, Jews in American Politics. Welcome, all three panelists. Our first speaker is Hava Hotel. Thank, Thank you so, so much, much Dr. Dr. Sussman, Sussman, for that introduction, and Brooke, for your terrific introduction. Uh, it's an honor to be here on this panel today with Professor Small and with Mr. Foreman. And I would also like to thank the Federation of Palm Beach County and Louise Fleischman of the Jewish Community Relations Council for having the foresight bringing us all together today to discuss this very important topic. So. ADL started with four and a hundred and one years ago with a two-pillar mission. And that mission, on the one hand, was to fight anti-Semitism, to combat hate directed towards Jews, and on the other hand, to secure justice and fair treatment for all people, to fight hate in all of its forms. Is anti-Semitism really a threat? So we, we all come to this discussion this evening with our own experiences, where we grew up, where we were born, how we were raised, every place that we lived, and, and that informs this discussion on anti-Semitism. It's the anecdotal information, it's the experiences we've had that have been shared with us from friends and family. So I was born in Washington, D.C., and have always lived in the United States of America, 
always in a major city with a, with a pretty decent-sized Jewish population. Went, went from, from Washington, D.C. to Southfield, Michigan, outside of Detroit, then it was in the suburbs north of Chicago, then to Framingham, Massachusetts, college in Boston, and, and 10 years ago landed uh, in South Florida, where I was raising my own children. So, so take those experiences. Um, I was always very comfortable as a Jew, comfortable wearing my high necklace, comfortable on the high holidays, twice a year, walking the services, comfortable standing up, speaking out about my Judaism, I never, ever felt uncomfortable. I certainly had my share of experiences of small anti-Semitic incidents. My name is Hava. I was a basketball player, so my name was food for fodder for all of the opposing team members in middle school and high school and in college. Uh, another incident that I remember I was a senior in high school, and my biology professor came up to me and he said, where is uh, the $20 that you need to turn in for the field trip? That would be a normal question. I was late. I hadn't turned in the $20. But he followed that question by saying, I know you're Jewish and your dad can afford it. So small incidents of anti-Semitism experience, but always felt comfortable. So, so fast, fast forward, 18, 18 months ago, I took this position with the Anti-Defamation League. And, and one of the first things I did, and this was June of 2013, is I, I made the rounds. I went all over South Florida, South Florida and other, other parts of Florida, Florida, and I met with leaders of different Jewish organizations, heads of synagogues, synagogues executive directors, directors, rabbis, and I remember two conversations in particular, because they were poignant and they struck me. These were the leaders of large congregations, independent conversations. After telling them you know, why I took this position about my role at ADL and the relevance of ADL, they each individually said to me, well, do you think anti-Semitism is still an issue for American Jews? Do you think that this is something you know, that's still on our minds, in our top 10, and what's important? And 18 months in, I can tell them if I went back and had that conversation today, and I probably will, um, unequivocally, yes. We all experienced what happened this summer after Operation Protective Edge, the surge in anti-Semitism around the world. Unequivocally, it's an important issue, it's still an issue, and I'm glad we're talking about it today. So, what has they all been up to? Interestingly, prior to Operation Protective Edge, we had undertaken a global poll, polling 102 countries and territories around the, year, around the world, and the results came out in May of 2014. And what did we find? Big finding is that basically one in four adults worldwide harbor anti-Semitic attitudes. It's a global problem, not just regional. There are regional differences, but you can see from this map, which highlights some of the reasons in the United States, the anti-Semitic index score was at 9% in, I'll say MENA a lot. It stands for Middle East and North Africa. In MENA, the average index score was at 74%. Take that with what we experienced this summer. The, the shooting at the Jewish Museum in Brussels. A lone gunman attacked. He was a French nationalist. He had Islamic extremist ties. He killed four individuals, and his motive was anti-Semitism. Bringing it closer to home stateside, many of us watched on TV in Oberlin Park, Kansas, the shooting at the Jewish Community Center. It, it killed, killed three people. The, the gunman, gunman, again, a lone gunman, was a neo-Nazi, had ties with the Ku Klux Klan, and again, the motive was the anti-Semitism. Bringing it even closer to home. Whoop. I think we got a long slide here. Interesting, there it is. Take a look at this picture. This is one of hundreds and hundreds of anti-Israel protests that occurred around the world. Hundreds in our country, ADL actually tracked them. This was an anti-Israel protest in Miami on July 20th. 
of this summer. And I, I hear mumbling, so you're all reading a poster that this little boy is holding. Um, you know, there is legitimate criticism of Israel. What we saw this summer in the search was that the rhetoric, what we saw on the signage and the chance of these protests was not legitimate. It was outright anti-Semitism, nothing hiding. If you read the sign there, it's a long little box. This is four to five year old boy is holding the poster, and it also says F Jews. Nothing hidden. So the, 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 the poll, poll itself, itself, I said 102 countries and territories. What's, what's in, in yellow is the area of the world um, that was surveyed. What's in blue are those who the worst. And, and one statistic to highlight right here, because there were over 53,000 interviews conducted. Imagine that feat in different languages different nuance, with pollsters on the ground. And of those surveyed, it covered over, it represented over 4 billion people, which is 88.4% of the world's adult population. Pretty huge. So I keep referring to the index score. But the questionnaire itself, the survey, was 45 questions plus its subparts. 11 of those questions made up the index scores, and those 11 questions were negative stereotypes of Jews. And the index score was created by asking whether the 11 negative stereotypes are probably true or probably false. And the respondents had to say six of the 11 were probably true in order for purposes of the index for us to consider that they had anti-Semitic attitudes. So if you read some of these questions, Jews have too much power in the business world. Jews think they are better than other people. People hate Jews because of the way Jews behave. Jews still talk too much about what happened in the Holocaust. But the first one up there um, brings up a lot of conversation. The first negative anti-Semitic stereotype is that Jews are more loyal to Israel than this country or the countries they live in. And a lot of people have said, well, I feel that way. You know, I'm Jewish and I feel that way. Why is that a negative stereotype? Again, you have to remember, you didn't have to just answer probably true to one or two or three or four. You had to answer six or more probably true to be counted um, in the index. This sheets, we, we did a ranking system of countries based on score. So if you rank number one, it actually means you are the highest offender in terms of an anti-Semitic attitude. So not surprisingly, the West Bank and Gaza rank at 93% at number one. Also interesting to note in that first column are our partners Egypt and Jordan at 81% to 75%. So that means, you know, eight out of 10 people in Jordan harbor anti-Semitic attitudes. Another way to look at this, we're in Florida. My parents, over the holiday, were talking about the cruise they're going on soon and all the different places that the ship is going to port. So if you think about it this way, every place that you're going to port, you know, the people that you're going to encounter, there's a certain number that harbor anti-Semitic attitudes, and just social science data shows that. So here we have some of the lower numbers. You can see in the last column, the United States at 9%, the Philippines at 3%, it looks like a great place to go and visit. <laughs> um, I'm gonna highlight just a few of the findings. This there's so much data. Regional influence. There's an assumption often that religion is a bigger influence than region on anti-Semitic attitudes, and it actually isn't. So look at the two columns at the bottom. The one on the left represents Muslim respondents, and the one on the right represents Christian respondents. So look, for example, at MENA. 75% of Muslim respondents, 64% for me to respond, and you say, and then look down to Western Europe, you have 29% for Muslim respondents and 25% for Christian respondents. Another interesting finding is that fewer than 
of a respondent say that they interact with Jewish people very or somewhat often. So most people around the world haven't met a Jew. This graph exemplifies this. There's really only two regions of the world where people have sort of regular contact with Jewish populations, and that in the Americas and in Eastern Europe. And then of the 74% who have never met a Jewish person, 25% still harbor anti-Semitic attitudes. So you get, you get the point here. Holocaust, we had a number of questions about the Holocaust. Only about half of the respondents polled had ever even heard of the Holocaust. I think that juxtaposed to all that we do here in this country related to educating on the Holocaust and, and what that means about the world. And among those who heard of the Holocaust, a third believe that it's either a myth or that it has been greatly exaggerated. And again, that's different depending on the region of the country. Another interesting finding, the more that people overestimate the number of Jews there are in the world, the more they tend to harbor anti-Semitic views. So if you look at the divergence in this graph, over on the left, on the bottom, people who believe that there are 0 to 2% of the world's population is made up of Jews, their index score was 27%. And then it fans out at the end, those who thought or think that the Jewish population makes up more than 20% of the world are at 40% in the index score. In the West, the more educated, West, less likely to hold anti-Semitic views. And in the Middle East, the more educated, the more likely to hold anti-Semitic views. So maybe we're being educated differently. We all come with our own experiences. The, the major implication of this poll is that we now have a baseline. We have some social science data that we can use so that we can see how things change over time when we re-poll based on the work we do. Before this, the only social science data that ADL had or that we they had was from polling in the United States and in a couple of European countries. Now we have comprehensive information. It's also important to note when we started polling in the United States on anti-Semitic attitudes, it was almost at 30%, and the threshold was lower than what we used for these findings. Kind of interesting that now the U.S. at a higher threshold is down to 9%. So we have a lot of work to do, and I'm sure we're going to hear more about it tonight, and thank you for being here for this important conversation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor to be here, uh, Ambassador Foreman and other distinguished guests of the panel and uh, representatives from uh, France and from Germany. Um, I'm honored to be here. I'd like to say uh, a special welcome to my parents who are here, Norman and Trudy Small. It's nice that they're here. <laughs> and I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Sammy and Joyce Apple who are also uh, involved in the struggle against anti-Semitism globally. So it's nice that they're here as well. So I'm going to start off with um, a story. It was 1947 in Tel Aviv, and the leaders of the Zionist movement were invited to a special dinner, a very formal dinner by His Majesty's troops, the leaders of the British uh, government at the time in Palestine, invited the leaders of the Zionist movement in 1947. It was a very hot summer night in Tel Aviv, and you know Tel Aviv can be stifling hot and humid, and this was before air conditioning. And everybody was, uh, was formal attire, it was an official British uh, evening, so people came in gowns and tuxedos and top hats, and everybody was very warm. And the leaders of the Zionist movement with the leaders of the British government were on the head table up on a podium. And David Ben-Gurion and many Israelis, as you know, are quite informal. So in the middle of the 
dinner, David Ben-Gurion was very hot, so he took off his top hat and he un took off his tie and undid his shirt and he put the jacket on the back his, of his chair. And the governor was turning all sorts of colors, he was very upset, and he wrote a note very angrily and he gave it to his assistant and the assistant marched over to Ben-Gurion and Ben-Gurion opened the note and the governor said that this is a international travesty, this is a diplomatic, uh, this is going to be a diplomatic problem and that you have to put your formal attire back on immediately because this is a great insult to His Majesty. So Ben-Gurion wrote back, it's okay, Winston Churchill said it's fine. <laughs> he gave it back to his assistant and the assistant gave it to the governor and when the governor read this he became even more disturbed and upset and he was red. Anyways, as the dinner ended, the governor stood up and he made a beeline for Ben-Gurion and he said, what is this? This is an international diplomatic insult and this is going, I'm t sending a telex right after this dinner and this is, there's going to be a formal problem with the British government and the leaders of the Zionist movement and w what do you mean that Churchill said it's okay? And Ben-Gurion said, yes, it's true, Churchill said it's fine. A few months earlier, they were at 10 Downing Street in London and the leaders of the Zionist movement were meeting with the cabinet of the British government and Winston Churchill was at the head of the table convening the meeting and in the middle of this meeting it was an unusually warm spring day in London so Ben-Gurion undid his tie and opened his shirt up a bit and put the jacket on the back of his chair and Winston Churchill turned to him and he said I don't give a damn what you do in Palestine but here you put your jacket and tie on immediately. <laughs> So, to me, to me, this reminds me of the way the Jewish people used a little bit of chutzpah and creativity to survive. And we've used education and our capacity to think, to survive, and not only to survive, but to do well when societies permitted us to do well. And I would say to you that today, in the words of Elie Wiesel, who's the president of our uh, small research center, he said that today we're living in a time of a great urgency, when he was speaking about anti-Semitism. And then he went on to correct himself, and he said, no, we're not living in a time of great urgency, we're living in a time of a great emergency. And this is what Elie Wiesel said in 2003, and he went on to say that he's never been so concerned about the rise of anti-Semitism since the end of the Holocaust. And coming from Elie Wiesel, who is a, a scholar, and I think he sort of exudes the humility and wisdom in the great rabbinical traditions, I don't think he's an alarmist. He's a serious, rational thinker. And this was in 2003, 11 years ago, when he said this. And I think that the message that we have to speak to as a community, I think this community has to stand up to the anti-Semitism, not just in the Middle East and not just in Europe, but the anti-Semitism that is here amongst us, in our communities, in our streets, in the finest institutions that this country has created. And I'm thinking in the universities, in the media of record, and yes, even in institutions of power and government. And we have to remember in a, very, in a way that I don't think we should be ashamed because we're not just parochial when it comes to anti-Semitism. We know in our history, in the history of anti-Semitism, that once this disease is unleashed on society, it affects not just the Jews. We may be the first victims or the first intended victims, not always the first victim. But once anti-Semitism is permitted to enter into society, into our universities, into our media, into our government, into mainstream popular culture and discourse, that this hatred begins with Jews, but it never, ever, ever ends with Jews, ever. And this is the lesson that we as a community need to speak about. And those who claim to be liberal, and those who claim to be concerned about human rights, and those who claim to care about democratic principles and notions of citizenship need to take heed that we can't allow anti-Semitism to infect our societies because this is a human rights issue. Once this disease is unleashed, women, 
gay people, religious minorities, moderates, become the target of the extremists and the anti-Semites. Today, we are witnessing Muslims are becoming the greatest victim of anti-Semitism because we, we in the human rights community and we in the media and we in the intellectual community have remained silent while this radical reactionary movement is gaining power throughout the Muslim world but also in the Western world. And we are living in a moment where I think we've lost track of what's good and what's evil. And we need to speak out for the truth. Anti-Semitism, I'm going to be very crude and give you the history of anti-Semitism in about 100 seconds, so please bear with me. Anti-Semitism, in a sense, has gone through three major phases. There was a religious phase, a racist phase, and now a phase in which the, the notion of Jewish peoplehood is being attacked, i.e. the demonization of the Jewish people's notion of peoplehood and our connection to the land of Israel and to the state of Israel. What re is remarkable about anti-Semitism as opposed to other forms of discrimination is its inherent, and I'm choosing my words carefully, its inherent genocidal aspect. And it's genocidal because what the anti-Semites want to do is transform the Jew. And they want to transform the Jew to save the world, in quotations, to save the world. So when religion was the dominant way of perceiving reality, the Jew was the quintessential other. The Jew was the, 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 the group of people that committed diocide, that not only would not accept the Christian notion of the Messiah, but they were responsible in the eyes of some at various points for the death of the Messiah. And people believe that if the Jew, that the Jew was basically blinded by evil, that they couldn't see the truth, they couldn't see the light, and that they were blinded by evil so they were shut off from anything good. But what was remarkable about this anti-Semitism is that people believe that the Jew had to be changed and transformed and accept the Christian notion of the Messiah in order to save themselves, but also in order to save the world. So the salvation of the world was bound up in the fate of the Jew. And we know what the results of this were, not just to the Jews, but to European society, to Christian society that allowed this hatred to go unchecked. When the dominant way of perceiving reality was through the lens of race and ethnicity and of nation, Jews who lived in places and communities for many generations, for many centuries in some cases, suddenly found themselves to be the outsider again, but based on nation and race. So what people perceived the Jew was poisoning the purity of the white Aryan race, and this contaminant had to be removed. So unlike during the period of Christian domination, there was no way to convert your race because we were born uh, socially constructed notions were, were to bound up in the way we were born in our genetic uh, composition, if you will. So the Jew had to be removed from society to save the white, pure race and the purity of the nation. Today, the demonization of Israel has, in some circles, not only brought upon jihadism, if you remember, I think it's the discourse is beginning to change, but there were people I was thinking of a McGill University graduate, graduate named Mr. Brzezinski and other advisors to this administration who believed that if only the stubborn Jews would change their policies, that this would somehow dissipate radical Islam and somehow dissipate jihadism and bring peace to the Middle East and peace to the world. So again, if only the Jew, the stubborn Jew, would change their policy, somehow, miraculously, world peace would break out in the Middle East and spread throughout the world. And this, in my view, is a form of anti-Semitism, the dehumanization, the demonization of Israel. So on the one hand, we have radical political Islam. And when I speak about rad radical political Islam, it's very important. I am not speaking about Islam. And I am not speaking about Muslims. I'm speaking about a reactionary political force that is gaining strength in many Islamic countries, but also in Islamic institutions throughout the world. And this reactionary social movement 
is demonizing the Jew and demonizing the Zionist and de demonizing the Israeli and putting focus on the Jew and the Zionist and the Israeli. And over here, they're taking away the rights of women, the rights of gay people, they're taking away the rights of minorities, of Christian minorities, of moderate Muslims who want to live in a democratic uh, space and society. So when they focus on the Jew, they're transforming their society. And this is the danger of anti-Semitism. And in a sense, I would argue that the radical political Islamists are the shock troops, are the shock troops for the anti-Semites in the Western world. They're the shock troops of the anti-Semites in the West world because they're straightforward and honest and they speak the same language in English and French and German and Arabic and Farsi. They say it the way they see it. They're, they're, they're not putting spins on it. It's we in the West who claim to be liberal, who claim to care about notions of democracy, who claim to care about human rights and the dignity of all people to be equal in front of one legal system it's we in the West who have remained silent while this radical reactionary movement is gaining strength. And we, some of us, have put the focus on Israel and blaming Israel for the cause of the problems. Western democratic values, multicultural societies are inherently based on the recognition of the other. Emmanuel Levinas, the great Jewish philosopher, born in Lithuania, did his PhD in France. He was in France while his family were being liquidated in Lithuania and he survived the war. And in a sense, he brought Jewish philosophical ethics to the European university and he paved the way for other thinkers and philosophers, he's a very important thinker. And his work was based on the ethics of seeing and perceiving and treating the other. And that this was the foundation of democratic liberal societies. And Levinas, using Jewish ethics, wrote how the moment we see our face and the face of the other, once there is this recognition, this is the instant we become human. So the recognition of the other is integral to human relations and societal relations in democratic societies. And philosophers, multiculturalism as a policy and as a theory and a philosophy comes out of Emmanuel Levinas' work. And he writes importantly, and others have written as well, when we see a social movement that is incapable of recognizing the other, in this case, radical political Islam, the Muslim Brotherhood, for example, as one offshoot of this uh, social movement, they perceive Jews to be emanating from the urine of donkeys, that we are the descendants of animals, of apes and of pigs. So it's impossible to negotiate. It's impossible to have a democratic society where there is the social movement that perceives the other as non-human. We know from history, from the history of anti-Semitism, from the history of apartheid and slavery, of segregation, that once we don't see the other as human, this can lead to all forms of catastrophes. And I have to say that this reactionary movement the Muslim Brotherhood, if you go, this is where radical political Islam started, even in the Shiite world. And I would urge you, as a community, if we know from our history that knowledge is power, we have to read what these people are thinking and what they are doing. We need to know the language of the Muslim Brotherhood. We need to know that the founders, Banai and Qutub, perceived Jews as animals. They took European, the most pernicious forms of European anti-Semitism and incorporated into their notion of religion. They took the protocols of the elders of Zion, the forged document from Europe, from France or Russia, depending on, on which history that you, you read of the protocols. And the protocols of the elders of Zion, the lies about the Jews, lay the foundation for the Holocaust. And hatred and the Holocaust begins with words and it begins with ideas. And the, this lie about the Jews, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which led to the Holocaust, as Elie Wiesel and others prominently say, the Holocaust did not happen when the railroad tracks and the crematoriums were built. They started to happen when the words and the lies were accepted as truth. Today, the Muslim Brotherhood 
is the greatest purveyor of the protocols of the elders of Zion. They've incorporated the protocols into their religious doctrine. The protocols today in Islamic countries where the Muslim Brotherhood is active is today a mainstream ideology, a mainstream view. And we in the West, in, in Europe, in the United States, think that we can engage these Islamists because they're more moderate than ISIS or ISIL. They're more moderate than Al-Qaeda because they think through political processes they can come to power. They look down upon the beheading of ISIS and they think they can come to power through other means, through political means. But the goal and the ideology is the same. The root is the same. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is a problem. And we have to, in this postmodern moment, if you look at postmodern thought, one minute, two minutes? One minute. Two, okay. In this postmodern moment, when European philosophers wanted to go away from binary notions of we and they, of, of, of us and them, and we created this notion of postmodernity after World War II and after colonialism, that people like Edward Said and Michel Foucault championed champion the Iranian Revolution. And these are the main thinkers. These are, this is the canon in today's university are people like Michel Foucault and Edward Said who speak nothing about anti-Semitism and actually praise the Iranian Revolution as something akin to what the French Revolution was to Europe at Enlightenment. This is what we're dealing with. I would just like to finish, and I would like to, to say, and this is the dangers. And this is the danger, and this is where I think our community needs to stand up. And we need to educate our policymakers. We need to educate our leaders and the like. And I'm thinking, there's many examples, but the most recent example that I find disturbing is that when, when President Obama addressed the General Assembly and he praised the Imam, or Sheikh, Bin Baya. Bin Baya is a close associate of Kawadari. They work for the Kawadari Foundation. They're funded by the Kawadari Foundation in Qatar. They are the leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood. Kawadari literally, literally, praises Hitler's work and urges Muslims to finish the deeds of Hitler. These are direct quotes. If you read the Hamas Charter, they call for the killing of Jews and they've incorporated the protocols of the elders of Zion. And yet, the American administration and other leaders, other countries uh, in Europe and the like, have taken a soft approach to the Muslim Brotherhood and have actually praised them for their condemnation of the, the, the war, the, the, the horrific war that ISIS is live, lead, leading. But what's very important that I think that we meet, need to understand is that ideology, ideology is very important. And if Western governments are praising the Muslim Brotherhood and praising leaders of a, a organization or a religious movement that wants to exterminate Jews, kill gay people, kill Christian minorities, kill moderate non-believing Muslims, then we are in trouble. Because if we praise these people with this ideology, it's giving voice to the people, not only in the Middle East, it's giving oxygen, if you will, to what's happening in the streets of Europe. It's giving oxygen to the Islamists in Europe and in North America. And we have to understand that contemporary anti-Semitism began with the Jews, but it doesn't end with the Jews. And I work closely with people like Bassam Tibi, Harris Rafiq, prominent Muslims, practicing Muslims, who know that praising these Islamists are, are destroying their own societies, they're destroying their mosques, they're destroying their, their, their societies. And they're very active in fighting against radical political Islam. So if we are, as a community, concerned about liberal democracy, about citizenship, that everybody should be equal under one law, and there should not be second-class citizens, then we have to in the fight against anti-Semitism, I would argue, speak very loud and very clear against any reactionary force that wants to destroy democracy and harm its citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Small.
Thank you. Let me call on Ira Foreman. Mashana Tova. Uh, I appreciate uh, this event tonight and being on this panel, uh, the opportunity to speak. I want to thank the Federation uh, and Louise Fleischman and JCRC. I also want to thank uh, Lisa Lix, uh, Lixstein, who um, originally brought up this idea to me. I want to thank her for being here tonight. So I've been asked tonight to speak about what the U.S. government can do to combat anti-Semitism. Uh, what my office or our office at the State Department does to combat anti-Semitism. And I'm going to do that tonight a bit, but I will not confine myself to this because if I do, I'll speak for about two minutes and then walk off. Why do I say that? There are two reasons. First, we don't have the answers. We don't have a grand strategy on how we're going to defeat anti-Semitism in the 21st century. We don't have all the answers, and our toolbox is limited. The United States is the superpower in the world, and it alone cannot defeat anti-Semitism. There need to be a lot of partners that work with us. And th some things we do, frankly, I can't speak about. Uh, I am not a uh, professional or a career diplomat, but I have learned in 17 months that there are things that we do all the time that are private diplomacy and we can't speak about. And I'll try to give you the fullest idea keeping within those bounds. So tonight, I want to give you my perspective. Uh, after 17 months of doing this job, uh, 17 countries I've been to, a number of countries like France and Belgium and Ukraine, etc. I've been in multiple times. And I don't want to leave you with the impression that I am the expert. I've talked in the 17 months with a lot of people much smarter than I, who've spent much more time. So I'll try to bring in their perspective as well. Uh, and I'm just one voice, but I will try to give you where, how I see things. I want to talk first about how bad is the problem? Is it getting worse? What's at stake with this problem? Two, what does the State Department do? do? What does the Special Envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism do? Three, I want to talk about the complex complexity and the difficulty. Be very easy to simplify this problem and say that there's one way to attack it, and that would be doing all of us a disservice. And then I want to end with a little bit about a kind of a broad stroke of what we can do, what has to be done. And I want to end also with a related problem, which I will not call anti-Semitism, but I think we should understand it as we think about Jewish communities, particularly in Europe. So how bad is the problem and what's at stake? So I think it's really, really critical that we get this right. I do a disservice to this issue if I oversell this to an audience like you or, frankly, to the White House. If I say the sky is falling, I also do a disservice if I undersell this problem. So I think we have to get it right. So what does that mean? Well, the first thing I think it means is this is not 1939. It is not 1939. Now, history never repeats itself, so that's easy to say. And this is not to say that, in the, that, we won't, that Jews do not face violence and even death in certain countries. But we're not, I don't believe, five yar years from boxcars to Auschwitz. So what is at stake? I think the very viability of a number of Jewish communities around the world, particularly in Europe, is at stake immediately. And not only viability, but the vitality of other communities that are not going to go away right away. Now, it's easy to say, well, we lose a community. Some of these communities are 500 years old. Some are 1,000 years old. Some are 2,300 years old. And in the next five years, they could be gone. But it's not only a question of Jewish communities. We're facing the, the crisis, the existential crisis. Can democracies in the 21st centuries, democracies that are our allies often, 
that we depend on in Europe and other places, depend on in, our, in, in the worldview that we have, can they protect religious and other minorities? And if they can't, that's a very, very bad statement. So, is it getting worse? Well, the first thing I think we have to do, again, being to be critical, to get it right, we have to look at the data. And unfortunately, the data is not great. I want to thank the ADL for this first set of polls, and I know they're going to do a follow-up, because this is a set of data points that will be helpful to us to track. But there needs to be a lot more. We have hate crime data from many countries in the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, some 50 countries from North America all the way to Central Asia, are required to keep hate crime data. And fortunately, mo in most cases, we keep data very poorly. That has to stop. So we have to look at data. We also have to look at what's the anecdotal. If we don't have perfect data, what does our gut say? What do we think we say? Well, the data generally says things, yes, they are getting worse. The Cantor Center in Tel Aviv, uh, if you look at their chart lines from 2004, there is a steady uprise, even before this summer and this year. Uh, there are other sets of data on hate crimes, very imperfect data that say some of the same things. But I think it's more anecdotal data that is really compelling. I have not talked to anybody in 17 months who would not say to me that anti-Semitism has gotten dramatically worse in the 21st century since essentially 2001. And frankly, I've seen few who've even said that it hasn't gotten worse, particularly since the economic crisis of 2008. Now again, this doesn't mean it's worse everywhere. I would tell you frankly, I would think in Ukraine, it's probably better today than it was 10 years ago. But Ukraine is the outlier. So that's what we see, that's what we think. What can we do, what do we do with the United States government? What is the special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism? This office was created 10 years ago by a bipartisan act of Congress. Uh, outside of Israel, it's the only special office that deals with anti-Semitism directly. And as the name says, we monitor and combat. How do we monitor? We put out two reports every year that we collect from our some well, nearly 200 posts around the world. The Human Rights Report and the International Religious Freedom Reports, the two reports most read that the United States State Department puts out. And it's available online and it is uh, dense going through, but if you want to get a sense every year of what's happening, it is the best, I think, compendium of data out there, country by country, and in a world where Jews are only 14 million. We report on it in nearly 70 countries. We have the phenomena of reporting on places where we have anti-Semitism, where Jews don't exist. We also, also the, our office, myself and others in our office, we travel the world where we think there are problems and uh, try to talk to government officials, to NGOs, and to the Jewish community leadership to see, get a sense of what's happening. Now, the combating part is much more difficult. Um, diplomatic tools, I am not the expert on diplomatic tools. In 17 months, I've learned a fair amount. But I can tell you what we do. First off, we convene. And as I said, we're not going to solve this problem in the US government alone. We convene uh, nonprofits. We convene other governments, et cetera. An example, on September 2nd, we brought together the Secretary of State, three assistant secretaries, and a host of deputy assistant secretaries and office directors to meet with heads of 14 American Jewish communi uh, community organizations, including the ADL, the American Jewish Congress, B'nai B'rith, the Jewish Federations of North America, Hadassah, uh, I could go on and on. Uh, we also brought in three representatives of Jewish communities in Europe for a three and a half hour conversation on what's happening and, what, and an exchange of ideas. Another thing we do is bilateral diplomacy. Frankly, we can do most when governments are problematic. When we think that our allies or other governments can do a better job or are doing actually a bad job. That's when we have a most impact. And it's often frustrating where governments are doing the best job, we think. And frankly, we have the least leverage when that happens. Uh, here's an example. We do a thing called a demarche 
I can demarche a diplomat, a, for example, an ambassador from another country who resides in Washington, bring them in and talk to them. Uh, it may be a, a difficult conversation, it may not be, but it's a, an attempt and a way to get back to their foreign ministries and their governments, our concerns. And I will tell you, I have sat down with ambassadors where government representatives, their leadership, have said some really awful things, and we've made them know in no uncertain terms that we find this unacceptable. And those cables go back. Um, there are many other uh, examples I fear if I uh, will get fired if I start talking about them. There's also multilateral diplomacy. So, for example, at the UN General Assembly, uh, there was an effort by a number of diplomats in the United States to talk to other countries leading up to the UN General Assembly this year to talk about the issue, what is happening and what can be done. I think you'll see initiatives in the UN uh, further on this year with ourselves and other allies talking about anti-Semitism. Within the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, on November 12th, foreign ministers are going to be meeting in Berlin on the 10th anniversary of what was called the Berlin Conference on Anti-Semitism. Again, a chance for Western democracies to confront the problem of anti-Semitism and what needs to be done. There is public diplomacy uh, when, for example, President Obama last spring spoke about the anti-Semitism that was happening in the eastern Ukraine where there were reports of Jews were being told to report to the city hall to register to see who would be essentially unloyal and had to be, may have to be expelled. President Obama spoke out, and there are times it's critical our top leaders, not just our office, speak out publicly. But there's also private diplomacy. I can tell you when the streets, when some European capitals were out of control in July during the Gaza war, uh, U.S. embassies in Europe at times called uh, law enforcement, local law enforcement, national law enforcement, to, to ask, do you have enough people on the streets for demonstrations coming this week? And I know that gave some comfort to Jewish communities in parts of Europe. Then there, uh, there are conundrums, though. Many a times it would feel good to speak out and blast a country. But I can tell you, with, even within the last month, I had a Jewish community come to us and say, if you publicly take on our leadership, we take it. It will come back and rebound to us. Do it privately. Be frank with them privately. Push them privately. Do not do it publicly, only as a last resort. So we often have to make tough choices. Is it public? Maybe it feels better doing it public. But is it protecting a Jewish community effectively? And finally, we do fund programs. Right now, we're funding a program that ADL is doing in Greece and Hungary, two places where we now have anti-Semitic parties, openly anti-Semitic, deeply anti-Semitic party, Jobbik in Hungary, Golden Dawn in Greece, which have significant parliamentary representation, and they have street militia. I don't think we've seen that in Europe since 1933, before the National Socialists took over in Germany. And ADL is doing a project bringing NGOs, Jewish NGOs, as well as um, non-Jewish NGOs together to combat anti-Semitism in both countries, funded by the State Department. We do other programs like that around the world, some of which I can't mention because we would put our funders, the people we fund, in, in danger. So let me just move on to complexity. It would be nice to say this problem is simple. The first thing we should know, I believe, personally, we don't solve the problem of anti-Semitism. In my lifetime, your lifetime, our grandchildren's lifetime, anti-Semitism is likely, very likely, to be with us. It's been around for 23, perhaps 25, 100 years, and I suspect at least for the next few centuries we will live with anti-Semitism. But I like to use um, the metaphor of a faucet. We're not going to turn the faucet off, but maybe we can turn it down. And I also like to look at what is a good example of where we've been successful 
in a program against anti-Semitism. We only have to look back a couple decades in the Soviet Jewry movement. An amazing uh, story, especially in light of the failures of the Holocaust, where uh, a very difficult problem was largely solved of a huge Jewish community that was deeply uh, threatened and was largely saved. But Soviet Jewry looks very easy compared to the problem we face today. In the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, we had one address, one address that could solve the problem. Where was that address? It was the Kremlin. Today, to confront anti-Semitism, there is no one address. In fact, in most countries, there is not one address to solve the problem. And in every single country, Charles Small made some reference to it. I, we sometimes categorize these things a little differently. I see different forms of anti-Semitism. We see left-wing, anti-colonial, or anarchist anti-Semitism. We see right-wing, neo-Nazi anti-Semitism. We see anti-Semitism coming out of uh, communities from North Africa, say French citizens of North African, or even Turkish, uh, both Muslim communities. We see populist anti-Semitism, soccer hooliganism, people like Dudonné in France, the comedian who comes from the right, uh, supposedly, but has leftist antecedents and really has followers from both sides, and is essentially anti-establishment. And the Jews in France often uh, are associated with the government, a government that has done a tremendous job in the last, this past summer in speaking out, trying to protect its Jewish communities, but is also both political, main political parties have serious problems. Sorry, close to the microphone. Okay. So talking about France, um, we have um, different forms of anti-Semitism. France has multiple forms. So here's an example. The Fundamental Rights Agency of Europe, the European Union, did a poll in the end of 2013. I'm sorry, the end of 2012, that was released at the end of 2013. It was a poll of the Jewish community of the European Union. And in that poll, 29% of Jews, again, this is almost two years ago, said that they have thought of leaving their country because of anti-Semitism. The number in Hungary was 48%. The number in France was 46%. The number in, Br in Belgium was 40%. Now, if you just looked at that number, Hungary 48, France 46, you would think anti-Semitism in Hungary and France are exactly the same. Nothing could be further from the truth. French Jews are fearful of violence. Violence coming out of, as we said, French citizens of North African descent, of Turkish descent. Hungarian Jews are not worried about violence, but they face deep anti-Semitism right-wing anti-Semitism of Jobbik and problems sometimes with the government. In Belgium, you have similar problems as in France. You have, again, French, uh, Belgian Jews frightened in places like Brussels because of, again, Belgian citizens of North African or Turkish descent. But the government in Belgium has not spoken out like the government in France. It's a, it makes it a very different situation. So we have tremendous variations of types and how you address anti-Semitism in each of these countries. Moving forward, what must we do? Well, first we must have our allies around the world, particularly in Europe, recognize the problems, recognize the problems within each of their countries. Some of our allies have done a good job. Frankly, and sometimes we don't know what to tell them to do more. But we need to try and work with both them and nonprofits. We need first to get security. We need these communities to have some security. I can tell you horror stories of places like Sarcelles, France, of the types of worries of security that French Jews have. We need civil society. Talking to French Jews last month, they were very grateful for what the government has done. I hear some of the things from German Jews as well. But they're deeply concerned that civil society has not risen up. You know, in the United States, we don't believe in, in outlawing hate speech. In Europe, often they do. 
We believe the way you attack hate speech is you overwhelm it with good speech. So in this country, often when you say something anti-Semitic, racist, etc., you can say it. You're allowed. Not against the law. But you will get a raft, an avalanche of criticism. It's one of the most effective tools we have to fight anti-Semitism and other forms of intolerance in this country. We need civil society in these countries to rise up. The church, political leaders, nonprofit leaders, all forms of leadership in a community. That is not happening in another of these countries. And finally, but long term, we need education. And what does that mean? That's a great question because I don't know what the best practices are. I know just teaching about the Holocaust in and of itself does not solve problems of anti-Semitism. Sometimes it does if it's done well. But there are a lot of other things we need to know about what best practices are. Let me end briefly on the question that we don't identify as anti-Semitism, although certainly it has forms of anti-Semitism associated with it and forms, frankly, of Islamophobia. But before this summer's violence, one of the things we focused on was the attempts to ban circumcision in parts of Europe, primarily Northern Europe, the Nordic countries, Netherlands, Denmark, Scandinavian countries. If you ban circumcision in these small, with these small Jewish communities, you can, it may be the quickest way to end their viability. There are parts of Europe, sometimes different parts of Europe, that try to ban uh, ritual slaughter, shakita, but you can always then import meat. But with, with circumcision, you have three choices. You can, if it's banned, you can do it illegally. You can take an eight-day-old child across state lines, international borders, or you can leave. With many of these small communities, we think people will leave. So the United States government, on the basis of religious freedom, is going to be very adamant about talking to our allies around the world about the importance of religious freedom and the importance, the devastation that a ban on circumcision would take. Let me close by talking, say, ending by saying, I realize what we're saying can sound depressing. There's no end to anti-Semitism, not in my lifetime. I want you to know I'm not depressed personally. Um, I think often, as I said at the beginning, it's important to understand what we're facing. And what the Jewish communities of Europe in 1939 faced was much more dark than what we face today. Let's be honest. That's not to diminish the problem, the serious problem that we have. But also, as difficult as this problem is, and as complex as it is, I think we have to go back to our sages. Oh, Rabbi Torfon, many of you have heard the, the saying that we're not required to complete the task, but we are required to begin it. But maybe that would say, okay, if we start it, that's good enough. Well, I think Rabbi Tarfon gave us some other advice, which is more than that. This is a serious problem. We're going to need everybody's help on this. And he said, the day is short, the labor is vast, the workers are lazy, the reward is great, and the master is insistent. He's insistent, and to all of us getting involved. Thank you. Wow, this was an incredible uh, uh, set of talks. Very informative, very, uh, very interesting, of course, and broad-based. I, before uh, we move on, I want to remind everyone to fill out the cards that you have if you have questions, and be sure to pass them to the aisle. And I think Mary is picking them up. Yes, Mary okay. and Amy okay. are picking them up. Okay. You give them to Patrick Murphy and to Consuls if they want Yeah, sure. I, I think uh, Brooke made mention that Congressman Murphy is in attendance, and I'd like to invite Congressman Murphy to say a few words on perhaps the new initiative in Congress on anti-Semitism. So Congressman Murphy, thank you. Thank you. 
everybody's leaving. I haven't even started talking yet. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I know it's uh, getting late in the evening, so I, I'll try to be brief, but uh, thank you uh, for having me briefly. Uh, sorry I missed some of the presentations. I was up in uh, St. Lucie County, a uh, busy day running around, but uh, this is a, a very, very important event. And I uh, want to thank the JCC, first of all, for hosting us. Uh, great facility. It's, it's great to have this in our backyard. I uh, also want to thank the JCRC. Uh, I want to thank Hava, uh, my friend for your leadership, uh, the Honorable Ira Foreman, and of course Professor, Professor Charles Small uh, for, for being here, uh, for joining us. Uh, you all know our, our real leaders on this matter. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Louise Fleischman. And uh, you don't know I'm going to tell this story, but I'll be uh, brief in telling it because I had an opportunity to speak at the Federation I don't know, four to six weeks ago and uh, had a nice conversation about a, a lot of issues going on in the world. And uh, we got to talking and a young lady came up and was talking with us and three of us were talking after the event and started sharing our concerns about the rise of anti-Semitism in the country. Well, I went back to DC that following Monday and I sat down with Steve Israel, started talking to him about exactly what was going on in the event that I'd been to. Uh, we put together a letter and I uh, led a group of 75 members of Congress with Congresswoman uh, Mario Di Congressman Mario, Il Mario Diaz Ballard, Ileana Ross Layton, and Ted Deutsch, and Jack Kingston, and got 75 folks together on a letter to uh, the Honorable <laughs> Ira Foreman, and uh, had a chance uh, to uh, send that over. And uh, this is an issue that I think everybody here knows is a nonpartisan issue. Uh, and it's a human rights issue. It's an issue that uh, goes to the core of our nation and affects our values of freedom, liberty, and justice. And we need to not only uh, condemn, but lead the world in this troubling surge. And it's not just violence against the Jewish community. If we allow this to continue, other minority groups will be affected around the world. I'm sure that's been addressed tonight. But as America, we need to be leading the charge here. I had a meeting about two weeks ago uh, with Professor Deborah Lipstate, Professor DeRote, and David Harris, the ED of the AGC. And we had a meeting right before I left for the latest recess that we're on in Congress. And I got a chance to talk about the letter that I wrote. And they gave me that opportunity and that uh, forum to, to discuss it. And I committed that I would lead the charge, not only in the Congress, but uh, in the United Nations, because this is a fight that must be global. It can't just be in America. <laughs> this is a real concern and something that must be addressed with other parliaments, other equivalents of our Congress, with all countries to make sure that we do not allow the spread of this hatred, of these riots, of these attacks, of these protests and these boycotts to continue. So uh, I applaud the JCRC for uh, your continued support and applaud everybody in this room for being here, for staying so late, and your commitment to combating this because this is what it's gonna take. It's gonna take a united front, a united community to combat this. And when I go back to Washington, D.C., in a few weeks, I'm going to talk about tonight's event. You know, you give me the strength to go back and talk about how much support there is to combat this. You know, it's, my title is representative. Right? It's my job to bring your voice, your concerns to Washington, D.C. every day. And this is an issue that is right at the top of my list to fight against. So uh, again, thank you all for having me very much. I look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Congressman Murphy. Before we get to the questions that you uh, passed forward, I'd like to ask the uh, Consul General of France and the Consul General of Germany if either one would like to say anything.
Good evening. Good evening to you all. I hope you can hear me. My name is Philippe Letria. I'm the French Consul General here. Yeah, maybe, I, maybe I'll just, I'll just take it. Okay. That's better. I'm, I'm, I'm here, here with, with my good friend Jürgen Bosch, Consul General of Germany, and we are very happy to be with you tonight. So I'll give the floor to Jürgen in a minute, but I would like to say a few words. Is it, is it better like this? Okay. Uh, I was very interested and thank you for what you, what you have said, which was very important. And I really share most of what you, you have said. The poll was useful and interesting. And thank you for all your, your words. You mentioned uh, a number of times the situation in France. And I want to tell you that we are all concerned in France with the present situation with the Jewish community. We were quite, uh, let me say, quite happy at the beginning of the year because we had seen 10 years of decreasing uh, anti-Semitic acts in France. And all of a sudden, we have an increase, and, and, and a terrible increase, with uh, attacks against um, synagogues, with uh, some killings in Belgium, and that was absolutely terrible. So we are facing a very hard situation. And the public authorities know about it, and they act against it. And you, you have to know that in France we have very hard laws and, and enforcement against anti-Semitism, discrimination, or Holocaust denial. This is something we are doing with the present government and with the president one. We are also working a lot on the web, because on the website you have to be there and you have to combat anti-Semitism on the website also. So we are also doing this. But we also have an important action, and you, you mentioned it, uh, I guess, Ira, at, at the end, on education. And the, there I want to let you know that I have the feeling, and it was also said, that after all, nowadays, we are in a very different situation than the situation we had just before World War II or at the end of the 19th century in France, where we had an awful and terrible anti-Semitism everywhere, all, all over the society. This is very different today. Our people is educated. They all know about the Shoah, the Holocaust. We all learn in school, our children, they all learn about it and they are very sensitive to it. But in France, we have, as you know, a very diverse community, and we have to live all together. And that, that was also pointed out by, by um, I guess, Charles and Ira. So we have to live all together. And we are facing a situation in, in, um, in the Middle East, and we have consequences inside, inside the country. But you also have to know that, I don't have the exact figure, but more than 70% of our Muslim community have a very positive opinion on, Jew, on the Jewish community in France. So this is also something we have to work on. If I may, if I may finish, conclude with something maybe not too serious, I must let you know that we have a new movie in France, and we had it last year, and it was very successful. And the title of the movie was Qu'est-ce qu'on a fait au bon Dieu? What did we do to God? And this is a French family, a very classic uh, Catholic family, uh, with uh, the father and the mother, and they have four daughters. And the first daughter will marry a Muslim, the second daughter will marry a Jew, the third daughter will, will, will marry an Asian, right? And so they have, our, our, they, they have the fourth daughter, and they pray to have a Catholic for, <laughs> for some of you know, that time. And so there is a huge pressure on the fourth daughter, and she falls in love with a young guy, bright guy, great guy, and guess what? He is a Catholic. So she tells this to, to her sisters, and they tell, just tell the parents, they will be very happy. 
And uh, she said, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it, and she doesn't want to do it. And after a long time, she, 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 there is a presentation. And she, he's a Catholic, he's a bright guy. The only point is he's a black guy. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, there we are, a multicultural society. And at the end, they learn about each other. And, and all the, all the um, son-in-law, they go to a Catholic mass, and the parents, they go to a Jewish service. So, this is, at the end, what I, I, the message I, I, I'm sure we should convey, and we try to convey in France. Let's know better about each other. Um, my name is Jürgen Borst, and I can only endorse what my friend uh, Philippe just said. Um, I think what is, uh, again, worth mentioning is uh, that education is paramount. Um, as you mentioned, Philippe, um, uh, in our school systems, um, Holocaust education is an integral part of our curriculum at school. I have two grown kids, they study in Berlin, and they have been to synagogues in Berlin. Berlin is today um, the fastest growing Jewish society uh, in, in Europe, and we are proud of this, and we don't want to get this destroyed by the latest developments. And this is the point where we really have to speak out. I know the bad side of the story is that we will never extinguish hatred or anti-Semitism in the world. But I'm pretty convinced that we will be able to get the numbers higher and higher of those who speak out and stand up for mutual respect, for um, uh, understanding, international understanding, respect to one another, and speaking out against hate, hatred, anti-Semitism, and every form of discrimination. I think this is what we have to invest into the future. It started already. Our kids have grown up in a a free and open society, and I think this is something that we should should um, uh, continue to, to to work on uh, in a in a in a global uh, effort. Um, what came to my mind is uh, a, a word of, um, and I, I, I believe you, most of you will, will will have heard it, of Martin Niemöller, who uh, was when he was young. Um, fascinated about the idea of uh, the Nazis and he applauded uh, the uh, coming into power of, uh, of Adolf Hitler but then he realized that he was terribly wrong and he was later one of the most proponent enemies of this regime and he was imprisoned and Martin Niemöller um, survived uh, these years and his famous quote is they came out for the communists, and I didn't speak out because I was not a communist. And then they came out for the social democrats, and I didn't speak out because I was not a social democrat. And then they came out for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak out because I was not a trade unionist. And then they came out for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. And I think this is the message that we have to teach to our children and to teach their children that this is most important. Speak out. Do something. And it is not only the politicians. It is the whole society that has to speak out. In Berlin, we are going to found a place where we will have an opportunity under one roof in the House of One, that's the, the, the name of this project, to have a house for prayers and other events of Muslims, Jews and Christians. The place is already designed in the center of Berlin and I think it's important to have signals like this to make very clear anti-Semitism and hatred and disrespect to others does not have a place in this world. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Uh, incredible words, and uh, we appreciate it. Now the fun part. Questions and answers. Uh, as moderator, uh, I, will, I want to ask the first question. As Louise says, it's my privilege. So I have a general question, a very basic question for Hava uh, regarding uh, anti-Semitism on college campuses. It really hasn't been addressed here, so if you can speak about that for a moment. And you, you, can, you want to do it from you your seat? You tell me, whatever you want. You can stand up from where you, know, where you are. And this, is, this is a half-day seminar at a minimum. It's a very big question, but I'm going to try to answer it very quickly. It deals a lot of work with the BDS movement on college campuses, boycotts, investments, and sanctions. Florida has a lot of activities as far as the BDS movement. There's a very large chapter of Students for Justice in Palestine here in Florida. So we really go at it from three streams, because there's three different type of types of help that's needed. The administrators, we work with the administrators, we work with the students themselves, the people on the campus, and then the needs of the surrounding communities that care, either the alumni or the people who live in the backyard of the university. So I'll give you one example. This summer at FAU, there was a BS resolution raised the day before summer session was about to end. So it kind of snuck up on people, it snuck up on administrators, the students who were on campus, nobody knew it was coming. So one angle, that we pursued, which we worked, we received a call from, from someone at the university who works there, and he talked through the process. What are we going to do? What happens? How many votes does it take? Is there a quorum? Is there a majority? Where, you know, can this annually be stopped? Uh, and the story, it, it went nowhere. It wasn't even voted on by the student body. So number one, being involved with the administration, helping them, guiding them on the line between what's legal, balancing what they need to do, what's legal in their universities, having an open marketplace of ideas and free speech, and then telling them, though, how also to make sure that the time, place, and manner restrictions are in place so that students who are on campus don't feel threatened by any activities going on when these demonstrations are going on, that they take place in a certain area and that they're small, and that they don't block your way to class, and they don't block your way. I can go on and on. Um, for the students themselves, we offer resources, materials, how to respond to what's going on on campus. We recommend that they don't count protests at the same time that there's protests going on. For example, because all it does is draw greater media attention, um, when in reality, very few students actually attend the anti-Israel or BDS demonstrations occurring on campus. And we also educate, we have uh, a new program called Words to Action. It took three years of focus groups in the making, but it teaches seniors in high school and the students who are on college campuses how to stand up and counter bias in the classroom. It goes through scenarios. Scenarios very specifically. So, for example, if you have a professor who gives you an assignment and he says, All right, I need a three page essay on how you compare apartheid in South Africa to apartheid in Israel. What do you do if you're a student in that situation? Very different from what us grown ups outside of school you know, might say. They're really there. This is their professor. They have to live with this professor all year. They want to live in the class. What do you do? How do you respond to that? to a different type of scenario in your library with your study group of friends and somebody, you know, makes some anti-Semitic comments. So, so that program was launched in Florida last year. Um, incredible feedback, very successful at educating our students. And that's just a snapshot. Thank you very much. Now the, uh, the questions. Uh, my uh, question better is uh, okay. This is open to uh, any of the panelists. What role do the media play in promoting anti-Semitism? What can we do about biased media coverage? Uh, 
important question. Get the microphone closed. Um, I think it's part of the problem. I think that the media has shifted in the last several decades. I remember when I was a student in London, at 9 o'clock we used to go down to the TV room and watch the BBC News. Uh, it was a 30-minute broadcast, and there were three or four documentaries in which a seasoned, educated reporter would go to the situation and cover the story, and they would take, I think, three or four days to do a regular news story, and then there was a program called Panorama, and in every country had these sort of special events, uh, once a week, or special program once a week, where they would do a documentary on a current issue, putting into context situations and analyzing situations, and inviting experts and policymakers to discuss it. Today, is just, we're living in an information uh, global network, the internet. The media has become a business. And the 24 hours news cycle is making networks. Uh, it's incumbent upon them to put a model, a good looking person, in a situation with very dramatic backdrops. And it's very, it costs very little to, uh, to produce these shows. And this is the news cycle that's going on and on. They have to compete with the internet. So I'm reminded, I remember when I was at Yale University during the Arab Spring. Remember the Arab Spring? It was becoming the Islamic winter. <laughs> and I remember CNN and Fox News and BBC and the TV5 and France and all the international media, they had all these good looking older people running through the square in Cairo where masses of people were demonstrating and chanting and there were fireworks and there was violence and threat of violence and Mubarak was going to be tall and he wasn't going to be tall. And this was a democratic moment. And it was I remember coming home from school and they were telling me the news right away to see what happened and what's happening. It was great. And this was the Arab Spring. But I remember that they were chanting in the streets of, uh, of in Libya and Cairo and other parts, parts of the Middle East. They were screaming, Allah Akbar. Now I read that many cartoons, Karl Marx, and there was so in all the founders of Lightning's liberal philosophy. And I didn't hear any of them referring to Allah Akbar. And in a situation, like Egypt, where the vast majority of the population are illiterate, where there's a tragic situation in terms of poverty, education, lack of education, where were the scholars, where were the serious journalists analyzing the situation, trying to understand what people were reacting to, do, which was the inflation, the cost of food, and the basic necessities skyrocketed because of the subprime mortgage catastrophe, the economic downturn, it pushed prices up of flour and sugar in the Middle East of the Places where people had enough and they, they couldn't afford to live it, and they revolted. But it, this is where the Muslim Brotherhood was invited by the United States and by European countries to help usher in this sort of Arab Spring. And now we see tonight there's a city on the border of Syria and Turkey, which ISIS is, is in the process of occupying. This is made up in 1939, but the anti-Semites are slaughtering people and beheading people as we speak. And these situations need to be analyzed by experts, by scholars, by informed media people. We have to give space to a media that informs people, not just with information and sexy images, but with knowledge. And we have to make informed uh, uh, observations and analysis and debate, and, and this is lacking tremendously in the United States and many other countries increasingly. And I think this is creating a vacuum in which the uninformed are allowing these reactionary forces to influence uh, government policy to, uh, and, and to promote their anti Semitism, which is having a problem with profound effect. And then, of course, there's also the funding of the media. The Qatari Foundation, for example, funds CNN, as an example. The Qatari Foundation is funding the top universities in Europe and in the United States. What are the implications of this? We need to have serious analysis, and we have to fight the BDS on campuses, the APL and other groups are doing fantastic and very important work, but they're fighting in the corridors. Why are courses being taught on anti-Semitism? at American universities, the contemporary anti-Semitism in the United States and in Europe. Schools are not dealing with the contemporary problem. And this is a, a, a crisis in education.
Thank you, Dr. Small. Mr. Foreman is not uh, getting off the hook here. There's a question specifically for him. Uh, Charles, you mentioned the protocols as a tool of the radicals, but yet you fail to blame the Saudis who gave the protocols as gifts, all their guests, starting from the 1960s. Why? Why the the Qataris are at the forefront of doing it now. Uh, the Iranian Revolutionary Regime, uh, also through their embassies and consulates, are spreading the protocols around the world. So whoever asked the question about the Saudis, yes, they played an important role in distributing this hatred throughout the Middle East and even throughout the mosques um, in the Middle East and throughout the world. So this is um, a serious issue. And it points to the illegitimization and the humanization of the Jews and of Israel. And I would say that the protocols and, and its incorporation into radical political Islam needs to be confronted. This ideology needs to be confronted uh, wherever it exists. And it is time, I would argue, that the, the monuments to the Holocaust in Europe and North America and the, the monuments and the course of the program to the Holocaust and the history of anti-Semitism is as profound in terms as should never be underestimated. And there's describes in Europe, Germany, France, and other countries on these issues. But I think that a real monument to the Holocaust will be when governments stand up to the contemporary forms of anti-Semitism, which is dehumanizing Israel. And it's not a problem for the Israelis in the Middle East, but the, the neighboring countries in the Middle East. You were talking about universities. This hatred is on the campuses of universities. This hatred is in the curriculum of the finest universities in the Western world. And it's being treated and, and taught as true. So we have to fight, unfortunately, in the corridors. But we also have to fight in the classroom. And this is how anti-Semitism is even entering the United States of America, through the campuses. Gener a generation or two of students are learning to perceive Israel and therefore the Jews in a certain way. And if Israel is the apartheid state, the Nazi state, the racist colonial state, then from a liberal human rights perspective, we're morally obligated to dismantle it. And then if Jewish students affiliate with Hillel and Chabad and other Jewish organizations on campus, these institutions which have a strong powerful connection to the Jewish homeland then become the target of these so-called so human rights people who are fighting um, the, the Zionists and the Jews. So anti-Semitism is coming in through our university. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Small, Mr. Foreman. Thank you, Mr. Foreman. Just wanted to add one more thing to that. Uh, ADL boots on the ground, practical implications. So about a year ago, uh, it was brought to our attention and we discovered that Mein Kampf is one of the top downloaded books online. Amazon, Barnes & Noble. So what do you do when ADL is not the business of banning a book and these companies aren't going to take the book off their book list? We got them to let us put a forward, a piece of information giving context to this book. Because if you can imagine, when I grew up and most of us grew up, we went to the library 
for so bulk and material, and there was a human being that you would talk to that might like tell you about the bulk, give you a little bit of context. When a book is downloaded online, there's no context. There's nobody that you're talking to. You're just reading whatever it is that's out there about the piece of literature. So now, if you went to either of the sites and you wanted to purchase Mein Kampf, you would first uh, have, have this forward uh, imparted to you that you could read, which would give a little bit of context about the download. Thank you, Ava. <clears throat> Here's an open question. When does criticism of Israeli politicians or Israeli policies become anti-Semitism? Mr. Foreman. There's actually... That's the question. There's actually a uh, U.S. policy on this. We say that criticism of Israel... Uh, we basically, U.S. policy is that Israel should be treated like any other country. That means criticism of Israel is appropriate. Sometimes criticism you don't even agree with is appropriate. But where it crosses the line, when Israel is delegitimized, when Israel, when we say, for example, that Israel does not have a right to exist, or Zionism is the only form of nationalism that is illegitimate, that crosses the line. When Israel is defamed, so something like what the Israelis are doing to the Palestinians is what the Nazis did to the Jews. That's defamation. When Israel is treated with double standards, that's a crossing the line as well. So we do have direct policy where we talk about where criticism of Israel, uh, sometimes legitimate criticism, then crosses over a line that is illegitimate criticism and anti-Semitism. Thank you, Mr. Foreman. I have uh, time for one more question. Again, open to uh, any of the panelists. What can local Jewish communities do to be supportive of the embattled Jewish communities in Europe? Anyone want to take that one? Well, we do not. Um, in my position, I'm not in the position of telling Jewish communities or any other group what to do. Uh, nonetheless, uh, what I would say to you, we have tools of democracy. We have the ability to petition our members of Congress. We have the ability to bring up issues to Congress, to the executive branch, and frankly, we have the ability to talk to people who represent foreign governments. Um, so using those tools of democracy, letting people know uh, that we are concerned with what's happening in other countries uh, is very important. Also, I think as we look at a lot of NGOs around the world, uh, again, I think the resources that we put into combating anti-Semitism probably need to be reassessed. So some of our Jewish organizations who have many, many important missions, perhaps some of them should also say, are we doing enough on anti-Semitism? Uh, and that's something perhaps you do at a global level in that type of assessment. So again, without specific instructions, I can, I can uh, make those types of recommendations. Great answer. Hava, you're up. One, one more point. Um, I mentioned earlier private diplomacy. We've become a community of sound bites, and we'd like to hear everything shouted from the rooftops. And we basically, as Jewish organizations, and that's what the question was, what do Jewish organizations, what can we do? We have a toolbox. We have a lot of things we can do. And sometimes, there's, sometimes it's the appropriate time to be public to shout out in the media, to put an advertisement in the New York Times, to, to say it out loud, but other times there's important time for private, behind the scenes diplomacy. So we have to remember when we do do something as an organization, the most important community first is the victimized community, the individuals who are actually being infected in their community and their country. So make sure that whatever it is you do do, You've spoken, spoken to two people who are around the ground, and that, that conversation is part of the solution. I'll just say uh, very quickly, 
Uh, we're not a Jewish organization. I'm the director of ISGA, which is the Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism and Policy. And we run programming at top tier universities in the United States and Canada. Uh, we're at McGill University, Harvard. We work at Stanford, Columbia University. Uh, we were doing work at the University of Miami last year. We opened in uh, Sapienza University in Rome, which is the largest university in Europe. And in December, we're opening in Paris at the Cerbon and the CNRS are opening a program there. So we're, we're developing a very strong network of scholars and educators. We're trying to educate scholars and students on the interdisciplinary study of anti-Semitism. So perhaps uh, the US State Department, our friends in Europe, would be interested in funding the highest caliber of scholars to doing very, very cutting edge research in these areas. Thank you. Okay, we have one more speaker, but at one shameless moment, I'd like to thank my wife for being here, Jane Sussman. Very, very briefly, I want to thank our esteemed panel and our moderator for the sobering program that we all heard this evening. I'd also like to extend my thanks to Congressman Patrick Murphy for his continued efforts to combat anti-Semitism and for the remarks from our Consul General. Before we close the program this evening, I want to bring everyone's attention to the fact that November is celebrating Human Rights and Diversity Month. We have some fabulous programs, and I urge all of you to pick up a flyer on your way out. I'd like to bring everyone's attention to a program that's being sponsored with the JCRC along with the Davis Foundation and the Palm Beach County um, State College. They are sponsoring a photo exhibit of the Soviet Jew movement. It's going to be on exhibit from November 3rd through the 26th, and it's really going to be a fabulous um, showcase of the Soviet movement, Soviet Jewry movement. I also have two other programs I'd like to bring everyone's attention to. The Jewish Community Relations Council will be hosting Carl Domino, Republican candidate for the District 18, and that's going to be held at the Federation offices on Community Drive in West Palm Beach. And likewise, the JCRC will be hosting Congresswoman Lois Frankel on Tuesday, October 21st at 4 o'clock, and that is also to occur at the Jewish Federation Office of Sun Community. Thank you very much for your attention this evening and for attending our program.